Welcome to Vineyard Boise. It's our vision to make the invisible God visible wherever he places us. We come together on Sundays to worship and fellowship corporately, but we know that church isn't just about Sunday. It's about a lifelong day-to-day -day following of Christ with other believers. We invite you to join us just as you are. If you'd like to support our ministry, visit vineyardboise.org and click the Give Online button. Today's our final message in the Teach Us to Pray series. We've been going through the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the prayer that, that we call it the Lord's Prayer. It's a prayer that Jesus gave his disciples when they asked him, would you teach us to pray? They recognized that his prayer life was, was different than theirs. It was better. It was deeper. It was more powerful and effective and intimate. And so they said, would you teach us to do that? And so he gave them this prayer. And, and uh, you know, it's, it really, it's a prayer that it, it's designed to be prayed in between Jesus' first and second coming. For all disciples, all followers of Jesus, it's, it's actually a daily prayer. It's not just one that's to set aside for special occasions or liturgical moments. It's actually a, a whole framework for prayer that, that grows with us as, as we uh, literally place ourselves inside of this prayer and live outside of this, or live inside of this prayer. It, it'll grow with us. You can, in every single day, in every season, this prayer is appropriate. Because we treat it not just as a script, but as a framework to allow us to pray through wherever we are in that moment. But Jesus gave it in between his first and second coming. And, and this is a unique moment in time in terms of human history. We, have a, we, have, we live in a special time because we live in this time where there's this kind of dual regency, where we have the, the kingdom of God has broken in in the life and the death and resurrection of Jesus. The kingdom of God has broken in to his fallen creation, but uh, evil is still present and it has not, been, has not been removed. It's been conquered, but not removed. And we looked at this last week, and so there's this, there's this conflict of, of powers. We, we've talked about it just in a practical way. It's a little bit like in our nation when we have a presidential election and a new president is, is elected. Well, they, they get elected at one moment, but it's, it's several weeks later. It's, I think it's as much as 12 weeks later when they actually get inaugurated and put into office. There's this 12-week window where there's actually a dual regency. There's two presidents. There's the outgoing president whose power has been limited, and they can do a few things like pardon a few criminals or things like that. But for the most part, their power is done and they're on their way out. And then there's the incoming president who's building his cabinet and is surging in, in power and, and, this, and this whole thing is beginning to, to surge in influence. That's, that's where we live. God has broken in in the person of Jesus. And, and so we, we, we live in both and this prayer allows us to live in both and to be fully present in both, to be able to acknowledge the evil that still is present in the world and to ask God to deal with it but also to ask God to advance his kingdom. We want to see more uh, his justice breaking in. We want to see the hungry fed. We want to see the captive set free. We want to see the sick healed. That's, that's, this prayer gives us a place to pray all of that, even in the midst of what's still not yet. So it's a beautiful prayer. We, we, we saw that it, it begins with, um, uh, by addressing the, the person that we're talking to, which is important. You know, when you write a letter, if you write a letter that says, to my dearest beloved spouse, that's going to be a different letter than when you write, dear boss, right? The different content. You know who you're addressing, and the content's going to be shaped by that, right? So we start by addressing a good father, and then there's seven asks or seven petitions. I think it's, it's interesting that Jesus taught us to ask, not to beg. Begging is what we do of strangers, somebody who's unpredictable, somebody who's possibly capricious or, or, or we don't know what they're even capable of. Then, we, then we, we might beg. We see actually people who didn't know Jesus begged him to do things during his earthly ministry. If you look there, in Mark 5 and in Mark 7, there's a group of people that lived on the far side of the Sea of Galilee. And when Jesus encountered them the first time, he cast a demon out of a, uh, of a man into a herd of swine and the people begged him to leave because they thought, this guy has power that's disrupting our, our life. And they didn't know what to make of him, and they didn't trust him, and so they said they begged him to leave. Two chapters later, Jesus revisits that same community, and they think, well, that same guy that did something so powerful, maybe he can use that for good too. And so they beg him to touch their friend who's deaf and mute. And Jesus heals him. But it's begging because they don't actually know his nature or his character or his capacity. Jesus says it's not about begging, it's about asking. Because loving children who are learning by experience to trust the nature and the, and the capacity and the power and the character of their heavenly father, we just come with an ask. 
Seven asks. The, the seven asks, they, they have, the first three have to do with the Father, His nature, His name, His kingdom, His will. The, the next four are about the child. Give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us. Today we come to the closing. That We've looked at all seven of those requests, and, and if you didn't, you, if you weren't here for any of those, there's, there's seven of those out on the interwebs. You can find them on our website, and you can revisit them. Because each one, we think each one of these lines needs to be fleshed out. There's, there's a whole framework there that we can pray through. And we've tried to give some ideas about what it looks like to, to really live out of this line of the prayer. But we come to the doxology, and here's the way it reads in King James. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And many of us learned it in that version. But if you're using a different version of your Bible now, if most likely, most current versions, when you open it up, they don't have that second part of the line. In 13, they don't say, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Most of them will have a footnote and say, some ancient manuscripts add this, but the earliest and most reliable ones don't. And so what we think is that Jesus didn't actually, these actually aren't the words of Jesus, but they are words from Scripture. And most likely what happened is at some point the early church began using this prayer not just for a personal prayer life, but began using it corporately like, like we'll do today. And maybe they got to the end of it and they thought, hey, somebody needs to kind of button it up so we know it's done, right? You ever notice like, we, like somebody's praying and if they don't close it off, it's like, are, are, we, are we done? So we don't know exactly where it started, but we do know most likely where it came from. And it came from a prayer that David prayed in First Chronicles. And in this moment, David is, he's, David, King David, he wanted to build a temple for God. Israel had, 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 they were no longer wandering people. They were no longer nomads. They had put down roots in the promised land. And, and so, therefore, David wanted to build a temple for God, a permanent structure where people could come to worship him, kind of like we have a church building. And up until that point, the, the, the place where people came to worship God was portable. It was a, it was a tent. It was a tabernacle. And David said, I want to build a grand temple that, 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 proclaims who you are, proclaim, that's worthy of your majesty. And here's what God told him. He said, David, you can't build a temple for me because you're a man of violence. And my temple will be built by a man of peace. And, and that actually foreshadows Jesus coming and building the church, not through an act of force, but through an act of sacrifice. And so David's, David was told by God, he said, you know, you can't build it. And David said, well, can I at least gather the materials? And God said, yeah, okay. So David gathered just everything he could, and he gave of his own personal resources, his own personal wealth, gave this magnificent offering and said, here's what I'm doing. What do you guys want to do? Everybody, it, it, it's elicited all kinds of generosity. And then they've got this massive offering for building the temple, and then David prays this prayer. Listen for this last line of the Lord's Prayer in what David prays. This is just expanded. Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you our God, and we praise your glorious name. Amen. Right? That's his prayer over the offering. So it may not have originated with Jesus, but it is thoroughly biblical, and it actually has a specific purpose and function. So let's look at the prayer cards that we gave, I gave you. Um, and again, these are, these are just kind of reminders of the type of things you might pray through. Hopefully these will help prompt you and kind of prime the pump a little bit when you go to pray through this. Let's pray it out loud. Good Father, always near us, may you be known as you truly are. May your kingdom advance in us and through us. May your will be established over our own. Please provide our basic and our deepest needs today. Please free us in your forgiveness as we freely forgive others. Please save us from ourselves and from all evil. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours, now and forever. Amen. Okay, I want to look at how that last line functions a little bit. Because what happens is this, is this prayer, it starts with a, um, with a big picture. It's a wide-angle lens. It starts with God's nature, his character, his revelation, 
his name, his will. It starts a very big picture. It's all about him. And then we get into the asks, the, re the requests that are about us. And it goes, so, so consider the progression. The prayer begins very big picture, very expansively, God's nature, his revelation, his rule, his will. But then the next four petitions, they zero in on the nitty-gritty detail of our daily lives. And in this framework, we have a chance to talk about, you know, right in the very center is daily bread. Oftentimes, we go straight to God with, with daily bread. But Jesus taught us to first talk to him about his nature, his kingdom, his will. Before we ever get to our needs, we've said, I trust your will. If, if my will is in any way different or less than yours, I trust yours. May my, may what, my will my desires, my longings, my thoughts, and my will be conformed to yours. And I trust your will over my own. And with that in mind, then we begin to ask for things for ourselves, but we've already qualified it and said, I trust you. If what you want to give me, what you want to give us is in any way different, I trust you. In these asks, though, we, we get into the, the, all the not yet. You know, I, we talked about how God's kingdom is breaking in, but there's evil still exists. There's this now and this not yet. And a lot of times when we bring our requests that are, that are the last four that are about us, it awakens that sense of like all that's not right in the world. We talk to God about those places in us that still aren't fully like him. We, we talk about the way that evil is impacting our lives. We talk about, you know, the sickness, disease, hunger, poverty. We talk about all the things that are part of living in this still not completely redeemed world. And what can happen is we, in that, we can get it consumed in the nitty-gritty. And so we end with this prayer that takes us back out. It's like we, we, we start with the forest, we zoom in on the trees, and then we go back out to the forest. Because for this prayer to be life-giving, we want to end with it all being about God's glory, about entrusting ourselves to the one who was and who is and who is to come. So it embraces his eternal nature. It embraces the, his, his capacity to do everything, the fact that he owns everything. We turn our eyes back to him. We're invited. The doxology returns us to the big picture in which we can rest in the confidence that God can and will finish all that he's begun. This is grounding and it creates peace even when our asks don't come in the way we expected. And so the end result of fully engaging in this prayer, including the doxology, is the kind of peace that Paul wrote about in Philippians 4. Philippians 4, Paul was writing to a church that was experiencing a lot of difficulties and suffering and poverty, even persecution. And he says, you know, this stuff, living in this not yet world, it, it awakens a lot of anxiety. Here's what to do with it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Worship him as he is. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests, your asks, your petitions, let your requests be made known to God, and then the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul's, Paul's instruction to that church is like, look, if you bring your petitions, your asks to God, the things that, that cause anxiety in you, you bring those to him and just entrust them to him, even before those things have changed, you'll experience a change. You'll experience the peace of God resting upon you because you know to whom you've prayed. The God who was, who is, who is to come. The God who has promised that he's going to finish what he's begun. That we live in between the two comings. And when he comes back, he's going to make all things new. So that brings us to one question, one point of clarification we talked about ascribing to our Father kingdom, power, and glory. Well, we talked about kingdom in the second message. Pastor Josh taught on that second petition of may your kingdom come. We have a pretty good understanding about what we mean when we talk about power. But what exactly do we mean by glory? Andrea asked me this week. We were driving somewhere, and she's like, she's like you know, we throw that word glory around quite a bit in church environments, but I don't think we know what it means. Why do you keep using that word? I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> she said, we should actually unpack that a little bit because we don't always know what it is that we're saying, right? And I said, yeah, you're right. We should ask Pastor Mike to do that. So Pastor Mike, <laughs> would you come up and talk to us about glory? Oh, 
okay. Well, it just so happens I happen to have a card in my pocket. Um, yeah. You know, we talked about doxology. Doxa is a Greek word for opinion or an estimate. Technically, if you have someone give you an estimate on what your house could sell for, they're giving you a doxa. They're giving you an opinion, an evaluation. Um, so doxology, word of glory, an estimation or a value. Okay, okay, that's, okay that's, that's one. That's one way of capturing it. Um, the advantage of Hebrew over Greek is very simply this. And the Bible's written by Hebrew thinking, but in the New Testament, Greek writing people, but Hebrew thinking. And, and Hebrew tends to be a much more concrete as opposed to abstract language. Uh, they, they just, they, they thought of things that you could actually touch and feel. And so two words for glory in Hebrew, one is kavod, and kavod involve, well, it just literally means heavy, weighted. Uh, because when something important or momentous is happening, it's not flippant, it's not whimsical, it's not light and fluffy. It's just like, whoa. Kavod says, whoa. That's glory. So glory is like something momentous happening. Or you're honoring someone who's done something momentous or who is momentous. Now, if you do this for yourself, that's called vainglory. <laughs> okay, so uh, let another praise thee and not your own mouth is what Scripture says. Um, what's interesting, though, is the word that's used in the Hebrew translation of the Lord's Prayer, when we get to this line, is not kavod for heavy. It's actually another one, tiferet. Um, not as common, but tiferet involves a, a fullness of, of life. In fact, the word, the concrete picture in the word is that of a branch. Okay, so let me just show you. So this is the image I'd like you to take, only this is an opposite. This is a branch from which the glory has departed. <laughs> this is from my apple tree in the backyard. There's still one very pathetic, slowly rotting piece of fruit that refuses to give in and let gravity take its course. Um, I mean, there's a glory in every season. There's even a glory in winter, um, usually involving snow when you don't have to drive in it. But um, <laughs> But otherwise, there's not much glory in the inversion and, and just dead trees. It's a promised glory because we look for spring. The, the, the picture of this same tree in my backyard, uh, just going back to like June, um, is right there. Now that is, from a biblical standpoint, glorious. This is the glory has departed. When it's full of blossom, actually, that's still, that is still anticipated glory. You know when the real glory is? You've got green leaves and the branches are heavy with fruit. Okay? By this my Father is glorified when you bear much fruit. Mm. And so every branch that abides in me will bear fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay? So we're just acknowledging when we say this, Yours is the glory, which means yours is the life. And so anything that's alive in us comes from you. And he wants the life that's in you to fully bloom. You blooming, beautiful people. You. Is that true? That's great. Thank you, Mike. There we go. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back. Uh, we've left some space. We've created some space this morning to do exactly what happens in the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer began with worship, got into the requests in the middle, and then ends with worship. And so we're going to do the same thing this morning. And as the band comes, I want to tell you about something that I experienced this week. Um, we have a, a time on Tuesday mornings where our staff gathers for a time of worship and, and prayer. Uh, it's pretty leisurely. Uh, we meet at 8 o'clock in the, right off of the office lobby over here. You're, it's an open house. You're always invited to join us. And so it's primarily our, our staff is there, but we have people who join us who aren't part of the staff team. So we have the, the lights dimmed, and usually it's just one or two people, one or two musicians playing. This particular week, Mitchell was playing. And uh, at one point, I opened my eyes, and I looked around the room, and I wanted to pull out my phone and take a picture of what was happening. And I decided that would be inappropriate. <laughs> and so I just took a mental snapshot. But here's, here's what was happening. Jesse Meyer, Pastor Jesse, was on the floor. He was kneeling in worship. And right at the same time that, that I opened my eyes and saw him kneeling, Janet stood up 
and did this. And I just kept surveying the room, and I, I just kind of looked around the room. I got to Dawn, and Dawn was standing quietly against the wall like this. And I looked over, and Jeremy was writing something in his journal that God was stirring in his heart, and he was, he was just writing it down, and you could tell he was just immersed in the moment. I looked over at Sharon, and Sharon was she'd been where she'd been all morning. She'd just been sitting quietly before God on the floor with her head bowed. I look over at my wife, and Andrea's just standing there silently before God. I looked over at Kari, and Kari was bouncing. <laughs> and what was happening is that the same spirit was, was at work in each one of us, but everybody was responding to what God was doing in them. Here's the invitation. As we worship this morning, we're going to start by standing. Why don't you go ahead and stand up? Just to give you the freedom to, to move, but I want to ask you to pay attention to what God's doing in, move, in you and to respond to that. Let me say this. Sometimes what God is doing and for you to respond to it is to be still and know that he's God. Sometimes the, the, for me to respond to what God's stirring in me is to actually stop singing because I re realize that my singing is coming out of a place of anxiety, trying to work something up. Sometimes I just have to stop. Something else that happens often in our, our Tuesday mornings is that somebody just, there'll be a pause in the song and somebody will speak out a scripture or, or just a, a prophetic word that they sense God putting in their hearts. Um, that's, that's actually the marriage of spirit and truth. We say we worship in spirit and truth. Sometimes we're singing a lyric and it reminds us of a scripture. And if that happens, I, I usually pull out my phone and I, I go to that scripture and I read it and I just anchor into that once again. And so this morning, as the worship team leads us, we're just going to make some space, and Pastor Josh is going to have a microphone down here on the side. And if as we're worshiping, something stirs in you, a, a, a scripture, it needs to be brief, like 30 seconds at the, top, at the most. But if it's a scripture or a prophetic word that really calls God's glory out, that's what this is about. The parameters for this is we're, we're focused on God's glory, who he is this morning. So if you have something to contribute to that, just come up and talk to Josh, and he'll make a little bit of space for that. We're just going to dim the lights. We're going to very close the very end of the morning. We're going to receive communion together. But right now, we're just going to, to pause and ascribe glory to our God.
With a shout of acclamation And take me home What joy shall fill my heart Then I shall bow With humble adoration So we 
This morning as we were worshiping, God reminded me of the verses that when we make good decisions, all of heaven rejoices. He celebrates you. He celebrates all of us making the good decisions. He is not the God that some people have a picture of saying, oh, you did wrong, you did wrong, you did wrong. No. God celebrates having life with us, having time with us, having this worship. I just see a picture of all the angels just joining in in full worship, saying, yes, he loves us. Thank you. So what I saw was I saw the clouds up in the sky and the Lord was talking about his glory and his presence. And then I saw cotton balls, because if any of you have ever looked up at the sky, you just think, gosh, this looks like some light cotton balls I could just jump in. And the Lord, um, he knows I love some souvenirs. And so this is what he was saying. He was saying, these cotton balls, Dottie, when you put water in them, they become heavy and waited and when we carry his glory just like we saying we pour it out it's like taking that handful of cotton balls and squeezing out his glory to glorify him and when people are wet in his presence and what he has it's this tangible feeling that God really is here. God really is in this place. And so I just encourage you, the next time you see a cotton ball, think of yourself being filled with his glory and being squeezed out to glorify him. In Jeremiah 33, 3, the Lord says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. No matter your circumstance, seek him again and again. Ask him what he has for you that he couldn't give to you at any other time until now. Rejoice, 
Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. During worship, I just saw across the crowd um, the words in the beginning. You know, Genesis 1 1, John 1. He talks about in the beginning. And I, I felt like this morning the glory of God's, he, He's saying He's there in the beginning with you. He was there, He is there, and will be there when you have a beginning in your life. And even in those times of darkness and trauma, he was there in the beginning. began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it so everyone remember that if you're a Christian God will carry out through you the work that he has began so do not grow weary in doing good because at the right time God will bring the harvest I just have one short verse and I can't tell you exactly where it is, but it's my favorite and it's been coming to me throughout the sermon today and everything that's been said and it is this, it is Christ in us, the expectation of glory.
sing, let every knee So let every knee Come bow before the King of Kings Let every tongue confess that He is Lord Lift up your shout, let us join One of, the, um, one of the greatest things we can do to respond to God's goodness, to his glory, to his majesty, is to personally appropriate and receive what he's done for us. Uh, this morning as we sing multiple songs about God as our Savior, Jesus as our Savior, um, it is because he came and offered up his life that, um, that we can have new life. Church wasn't built by a, a man of force. It was built by a man of peace. And Jesus didn't, his life wasn't taken from him. It was offered up. This morning, we have an opportunity to receive communion. Communion's there at your tables. It's uh, gluten-free crackers and a cup of juice that you can dip the cracker in. In just a moment, I'm going to just read a passage and allow us to respond by receiving that. I will say this, communion at the vineyard, we practice an open table, which means that you don't have to be a member of the vineyard church. You don't have to have gone through a class. You do have to be responding to Jesus in faith and saying, Jesus, I receive that your body was broken, that I might be made whole. That your blood was poured out, that I might be made clean. And, uh, and that's not just something we do once. It's something that we come back to, just like the Lord's Prayer is a daily prayer. This is something that's in the rhythm of our life. We, we have this rhythm where we come back to receiving that provision. And it's beautiful that we actually ingest this. We actually take it in because it's in taking in his life that we receive new life. So we receive that as an act of faith. 
And so this morning, if you've, ever, if you've never received communion or if this is your, your, your hundredth time or however many, it's about personally responding to what God's doing right now and saying, God, I need your life in me. Would you bring me not only forgiveness for the, the stain and the guilt of my sin, but also free me from the power of sin? Free me to new life? Let your new life be unleashed in me. Let your resurrection life be unleashed in me and through me as I move out into the world today. So Paul writes in Corinthians, and he, he writes to the, the church in Corinth, and he says, If I receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it. He said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, today we remember you. We receive your provision. We ask for that forgiveness and new life that your kingdom would advance in us, that your will would be accomplished through us. Lord, in, in, in any way where our will, our desire, our thinking, our longings are, are in any way different than yours, may ours be conformed to yours. We receive your provision in faith. Thank you that you came with a generous gift, a surprisingly generous gift of yourself. So let your resurrection life advance in us and be awakened in us. In the name of Jesus, amen. You can receive the communion. This is how I fight my battles And this is how I fight my battles And this is how I fight my battles At your table At your table, Lord Truly goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. This is how I fight my battles. And this is how I fight my battles. And this is how I fight my There's some words for prayer this morning that our prayer team sensed God wanting to do this morning, so we'll put those up on the screen. If you are available to pray with people today, if you're part of the prayer team or just um, God's used you in that way and you feel comfortable and confident in praying for others, you're welcome to just kind of let people at your table know. And uh, if you're needing prayer this morning, like let that be known. And if there's nobody in your immediate area that can pray with you, we'll have some prayer team and pastors up available near the stage to pray with you. But we're going to go out from here with the intention and the capacity to make the invisible God visible. So don't forget about the uh, Whittier boxes. Don't forget about uh, living room conversations on Wednesday. We have a night of worship on Thursday night uh, here in the chapel. So I uh, would love to have you there. And apart from that, go out, make the invisible God visible.